interesting story in that you're related. This is your great grandfather's grandfather. Grandfather, not the Professor George Fisher, and this is going to let him. Michael introduced himself. We're so glad you came. I'm so glad you continue to do this research because I know it's a never-ending process. So uh, welcome. Come on up. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate it. Hello, everybody on Zoom and everybody who came here to the Oneida Historical Society, which is now under the new name, which is the Oneida County History Center. So there's even history within the history of the history. So. Um, at the end of this session, you're going to hear um, a video clip from a performance of the march that we're going to talk about here that Sousa's band played. And when I introduce that, you may, may not be able to hear that. Um, I said, this is what happens when life meets genealogy at a bar at a golf course. And that's literally how this connection to Sousa uh, happened to, to come to life. I was aware of the connection before that. But I am Michael Fisher, and I live in, actually, I live now in Jewel, New York, which is in Oneida County over on the north shore of Oneida Lake. But uh, I've been living mostly in Chittenango in the last few years. I was born and raised in uh, Syracuse area. And we're going to be talking about my grandfather, who is, depending on who you talk to, is either Professor George H. Fisher or Dr. George H. Fisher. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But. Um, before I do that, I would be remiss if I didn't thank, once again, Patrick Reynolds and the Oneida County History Center for allowing me to present this information to you. Just to remind everybody, the, the Oneida County History Center has a fantastic research library here, this 5,000 square foot gallery with rotating exhibits, and Patrick heads up the weekly programming offerings for uh, in-person or virtual guests. And they do have the on-site and online bookstore but most important of all, Wednesday is the telethon. Either show up or look online and, and uh, open up your wallets. Thanks for the plug. You're, you're, Patrick, Patrick said thanks for the plug, and you're welcome. I also would be remiss if I didn't thank the Central Winds Symphonic Ensemble. And uh, I was able to um, conduct this, this ensemble a couple of weeks ago, and you'll see that recording. And I would specifically thank Andy Perry, who's the artistic director and conductor, and, and Dr. James Tapia, who is also a conductor. Um, their cooperation and willingness to help me on this project um, is phenomenal, along with all of the members and the board of Central Winds. So thanks to those folks. I would be really remiss if you're not aware of who Fulton history is. This is a guy in Fulton working out of his house who has taken old copies of microfilm and digitized them where you can search through his database, a private person's database. Tom. Trinisky from Fulton, New York. It's a free site. He's taking all these newspaper pages, and through his efforts, I was able to discover all this about my family and my background, which I never knew growing up. Um, and I love this specific one. They have looked at the work that he's doing and the value that he brings to the genealogy community and, and to research community compared to taxpayer-funded public endeavors that never seemed to get anywhere near the same results that he's gotten on his own dime and with accepting contributions. So, Tom, if you happen to watch this, thank you very much. So a little bit about me, not too much, because this is really not about me today, is um, you can see that's me in high school. I was the, the uh, drum major for our high school marching band, and at the age of 11, I was in that drum and bugle corps. So I've been performing since I started taking piano lessons early in, in my life. I am professor's grandson. I have directed choirs and ensembles, and I'm also an amateur singer, songwriter, instrumentalist, and I've done some composing. Um, and I have to tell you, I didn't know any of this history of my grandfather, because uh, my sister is here today. Our father never told us any of this. He said, yeah, he was a church organist. Well, he was a church organist, but he was so much more than that. So what we're going to talk about today, a few things. Who was George Fisher? We're going, to, we're going to teach you a little bit about his life and who he was and, and his coming to his career as a product of the West End of Utica. Um, we're also going to talk about, uh, to coin a phrase from Gilligan's Island, the professor and Mary Grace, which uh, is, is my German grandfather and his Irish bride. We'll get into that a little bit. Not too much time on the family side of this, but I think it does help fill out the story. We're going to spend some time on his contribution to music in the Mohawk Valley and all of central New York, really. And I've got some really cool side stories. One is about Homer Whitford. You probably don't know who he is, but you'll learn a little bit about Homer in a little bit. 
and something about the Will and Balmer Candle Company and that relationship to Assumption Church. All of this comes back to head when we talk about John Philip Sousa coming to Utica. What I've learned is that everything is connected. We're probably, half of us are related in here. If you go back far enough, I can, can't tell you the, the people I've discovered that I'm related to that I never knew. So let's talk a little bit about Professor George Fisher and his early life. He was born in 1869, so just barely post-Civil War times in West Utica in an Erie Canal neighborhood. He actually lived at 46 Canal with his grandmother and his father when he was first born. Um, for a couple of years, they shuffled around Whitesboro Street. Um, my first date with my wife was to see the Doobie Brothers at the Odd, and apparently, apparently, that is where 46 Canal was, right in that site. That was, I believe the Odd was built where the canal was filled in part of it or at least part of the surrounding parking lots. So apparently on my first date with my wife, I took her to meet the family, didn't even know it. Uh, his parents were Bartholomew George Fisher and Catherine, Catherine Spratler Fisher, and he was the oldest of three children. There was uh, Frank Fisher, uh, was his next brother a year uh, later. Frank worked for the city of Utica um, for years and years until he died. He died relatively young, as you can see. Um, comparatively to the others. We, we have a lot of people in our 80s and older in our family. And Elizabeth, who when she was a child was called Lizzie, um, who never left Whitesboro Street her entire life. She moved further out, you know, as she got older, they, they moved to different homes as Utica City Center developed. Her final home was at 1130 Whitesboro, which is now an empty lot. The house has been uh, torn down. Um, I remember as a child meeting her, and it's safe to say that if if I had a chance to go back and have more conversations with her, that would have been fantastic. But as a young boy, I had no idea what, what that uh, treasure would have been. So let's talk about Bart briefly because Professor Fisher's story starts with his father. So Bartholomew George, Uncle Bart was his, was his nickname. They called him Uncle Bart. He was really well known in, in specifically in the West End of Utica, but also throughout, throughout the rest of the city. This guy was at different times in his life was a peddler. He worked for liquor distributors and breweries. He was a cigar manufacturer, he was a barber, and he had places of business at various places up and down um, Genesee Street. And he was part of the original Concordia Society, which is a men's choral group based at St. Joseph's Church on, I guess, Columbia Street, right? And you can see on this one, when they formed it, he actually was, was the treasurer. One note, the C in Fisher, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. So uh, what we've learned is that people like to spell things differently depending on the mood they were in, apparently. So um, Bart was interesting. Bart, um, was actually, he became a conductor not too long after the society was formed. And I love when you see damning with faint praise in a newspaper article. So if you see that, the piece on the left, from uh, one of the Utica newspapers, it says, Bartholomew Fisher led acceptably. <laughs> so when I saw that, I was like, well, because everything else I read about everybody else in any p newspaper in Utica is effusive in praise and probably going way above and beyond. In this case, I think Bartholomew Fisher led acceptably means he probably stumbled out of the gate a little bit. So uh, when I conducted a couple of weeks ago, I was very nervous, so I think I channeled a little bit of Uncle Bart in that. So that's, Uncle Bart's my great-grandfather. So interesting thing about him is he actually died on the street at the busy corner. Yep, he was on his way to a new job. He quit one liquor distributorship and went to work for another. And he said hello to somebody and then took three steps and it, he, he fell over and he was dead before he hit the ground. That's not a bad way to go. He loved life up until the very end of his life. He was working and staying busy. His wife had died. Catherine Spratler Fisher died the year before. So. Um, so he was still looking forward, but he died, according to the doctor, of either apoplexy or a heart attack, depending on uh, which reporter you talk to. So Professor Fisher was a student of West Utica. He was raised in St. Joseph's Church. That was the family parish. Before it was merged with St. Joseph's, became St. Joseph's St. Patrick's. At the age of 15, and this is an important note, at the age of 15, he started organ performance lessons. It's my belief that he actually started 
studied piano before that, and I also know that he was in the church choir there, in a boys' choir. And he studied under George J. Baumer, and that name will come back in a minute as we do some of our detours, who was at St. Joseph's Church for not a long time, but for a few years, uh, Professor George Baumer relocated from Syracuse to Utica to be the headmaster at St. Joseph's School, as well as a director and uh, organist. He also studied under J.J. Raleigh uh, at St. Patrick's Church, and J.J. Raleigh ended up moving to Syracuse and became really the head of the music for the entire Syracuse City School District at one point. So these are guys that knew what they were doing. He also was influenced and worked with, and I don't know if he took lessons from, but he certainly performed with Professor Albert L. Barnes, who was a machinist. He, he learned how to tinker with machinery at a young age, working in factories while he was a teenager. He also learned to play the organ, and he became a composer. And then he put all those things together and became an organ builder. And in fact, the organ at St. John's Church was the last organ that, that uh, Barnes built in conjunction with his, um, with his partnership, and it broke him because they went way over budget on building that fantastic organ, which has, I know has since been re, remodeled and updated, but um, uh, unfortunately that led to his uh, depression and he ended up committing suicide. Um, Something you don't see today, but he committed suicide by inhaling the gas that was, that was pumped into houses for lighting. You know, before electricity, they, they would pump gas in. So he opened up a valve and, and died. And he was buried in a, a Christian funeral because the medical examiner said that he was insane at the time of his death. Therefore, it wasn't really truly considered a suicide. So one of the things that, that Barnes did besides building the St. John's organ was he was a composer. And he wrote this March Militaire and he dedicated it to Professor George H. Fisher, Esquire, Utica, New York. This was in about 1903, I think, or 1904, somewhere in that range, just a few years before he died. And ironically, I discovered this while searching for information about my grandfather, and Barnes is a whole other well of Utica history that's wrapped up in him. So that's another discussion for another presentation, probably by somebody else, because I have other things ahead of, ahead of this. But if you work on genealogy, you know that every step you take turns you into this other world of directions you can go in more rabbit holes. So let's go back to George Fisher now and talk about our Gilligan's Island friend, the professor, and Mary Grace. So he married Mary Grace. Her nickname was May. Grace Sean is now. She was born in 1873, so she was four years younger than him. She was, she was born on April 23rd, 1895. Midge knows, happens to be my son Patrick's birthday. Nice coincidence. And her family was part of the St. Patrick's Parish at the time and then moved to St. John's Parish. Her family owned, in the arcade building, Shaughnessy Brothers Hardware. I would love to be able to find information about that, and I've been digging it up. The only thing I found so far is an actual letterhead, an actual piece of paper letterhead from Shaughnessy Brothers, other than newspaper clippings and those kinds of things. So I, I keep searching for more information about the Shaughnessys. So we have the German, Irish, she was a student at St. John's Church in her high school years, and she was a soprano in the school and church choir. It's no coincidence that Professor Fisher, one of his early jobs was the choir director at St. John's Church, so he ended up marrying a soprano in his choir. They had nine children, including two infant deaths. Interesting note I found, and I'll read a little bit from this because it's hard for you to see, but this is about a concert that was held at St. John's, and it's really talking about her performance as a soprano. Apparently she had a beautiful voice and was an accomplished singer. As you'll see in a minute, her family obligations took away from her musical performances. So after a few children were born, we see no reference in the newspaper of her doing anything other than occasionally singing at someone's wedding to accompany, to sing as uh, her husband would accompany the, on the organ. That's our family. Top left is my father, George. He's the youngest of the family. Top right is our Aunt Elizabeth, I'm sorry, is our Aunt Dorothy, who became Sister Mary Letitia. She became a Franciscan nun in Syracuse at St. Joseph's Hospital, which ironically is the same hospital that was founded by Mother Mary Ann Cope, who became, uh, Barbara Cope, who became Mary Ann Cope, who became St. Mary Ann. Um, so we have our family, and they're obviously from the west end of Utica as well. So you see my, um, uh, to the left, as you're looking at it, of Dorothy in the back row with glasses, that's our Uncle John. We're going to talk about him again in a minute because he's related back to the story of the music uh, 
uh, that George Fisher brought to the Mohawk Valley and to central New York. The other siblings, I'll give you their names. There'll be a test later, or we can skip that. But you can obviously see, you can see my grandmother and my grandfather. Another rabbit hole here, Patrick, this is for you. This is a Fry Studio piece. I'd love to know whatever happened to all of the, all of the original photography from Fry Studios. I'd love to discover there's a vault somewhere in Utica that has all of his old work because I personally am aware of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs and portraits from my family that were taken at Fry, and there must be a lot more out there. So um, that's another search for another day. So here's a, on the left is my grandmother. That's May Grace. Out in Oneida Lake, th th those two pictures were taken probably less than a half a mile for, from where we live today as part of a family area. Uh, in fact, on the right-hand side, um, that camp is still occupied by my cousin um, who, who lives there in the summers. So we're still part of that community there, and that, that was an uh, important part of our upbringing. So here are a few photos of Professor George Fisher. On the left, that was taken um, when he was directing um, a boys' choir at St. Vincent's Industrial School, and that was from a newspaper article about that. You see the portrait in the middle. The photograph on the right was the last picture that I have of him that was publicly available. Um, that was in his obituary, so that's his obituary photo. Here is, on the left, a photo of my eldest sister, Diane, with our grandfather, and then he's in the middle, and another portrait very close that was taken on the right while he lived in Syracuse, so probably around 18, I'm sorry, around 1950. Here are a couple of shots with our father and George Fisher. So you start to see that he was pretty active within the family and, and attending functions right up until he died. So we're going to talk about his music career in several, several segments. The first one is St. Mary's Church in Rome. He was 16 when he took that job. He studied his organ performance from the age of 15. So a year later, he was commuting. I don't know how you commute to St. Mary's in Rome when you live on Whitesboro Street. But he was commuting to Rome to be the organist at St. Mary's Church. He did that for a year and a half or so. Then he went to the other St. Mary's Church in Little Falls, spent a little bit of time there, and then he found a job a little closer to home, a little less wear and tear, and ended up at St. Francis de Sales Church. Again, short term there, an opening came up at St. John's Church. I firmly believe that Professor Raleigh and Barnes had something to do with him getting that job. Can't prove it. And he was there from 1888 to 1933. So that is 55 years, is that right? 45 years? 33 and 12, it's 45. The other digit there that I dropped is from the rest of his tenure. When he left St. John's, the family relocate, re relocated to Syracuse at Assumption Church, which not coincidentally was the home parish of Professor George Balmer, who was his first organ instructor. So he ended up back at Assumption Church from 1934 until literally the week before he died in 1952. We'll come back to that Assumption Church in a minute. He was also a teacher. He taught piano privately, and there are newspaper ads where he is seeking students. Um, he taught at the St. John's School for Girls, Assumption Academy, where our father went to school. Um, he was also involved with the Masonic Home, the Boys Choir at St. Vincent's, as I mentioned. And secularly, he was involved with the Orpheus Club, St. Uh, Utica Symphony Orchestra. He was a conductor. St. Joseph's Infant Home, he performed there. Um, Utica Manor Corps, he was a lifetime member of the Manor Corps. I'm a member of the Manor Corps now. Um, he also did a lot of work with the Masonic Temple and Sicilian Male Quartet, and I could go on and on and on. There are hundreds and hundreds of notations of his performances, whether weddings, funerals, important masses, dedications, parties, whatever. He performed all the time. Music was his only job, and it was his love. Again, I wish I knew all this back in my day. So here are a couple of clippings uh, talking about uh, the Orpheus Club and St. Patrick's Day. So if you're, if you're watching this later, virtually you can pause and actually look at these, right? So we're going to do a little side story. Another one of the contemporaries in the 1900s of George Fisher was a guy named Homer Whitford, who was an organist, composer, and arranger. Homer Whitford influenced my grandfather and had a connection with him, and I think they probably influenced each other. We're also going to talk more about the Willem Barmer candles and that relationship in a minute. But Homer Whitford was born in 1892, so 
younger than my grandfather, was an up-and-coming guy, a very studied organist, classically trained organist. My grandfather studied, essentially, by attending one-on-one uh, -on -one lessons with these other instructors. As far as I can tell, he never went to college, had no degrees, and yet they called him professor and doctor. Homer Whitford, on the other hand, had, had uh, degrees from several colleges, and for a time during World War I was the director of the U.S. Army Band, and I understand he was relatively young when that opportunity presented itself. For a short time, for four years, he reloc relocated to Utica to the Tabernacle Baptist Church. While he was in this era, he married uh, his wife, who was from Waterville, the Waterville area. He was also published by J. Fisher and Brother in New York, the same publishing house that published most of our grandfather's works. And he was a colleague of A.L. Barnes and George H. Fisher. It may surprise you to know that our father, my dad, left Utica to go fight, actually he left Syracuse by that time, to go to World War II. He was stationed in the Pacific Northwest, where he came back with a war bride whose maiden name was Whitford. So what we have now discovered, in addition to being related to George Fisher, who's a composer of some note, and a musician galore, we're also related to Homer Whitford, uh, who is our fourth cousin, three times removed. So um, I'm taking everything I can get when it comes to this, okay? So I don't care if you're my eighth cousin, you're getting on my list, so. Because um, I do believe we're all connected. So going back to the Barmer connection, I, any of you recognize that? Do you recognize that smokestack on the right? If you go to Destiny Mall in Syracuse, you pass it all the time. If you drive up Buckley Road coming off of Route 81, that is the site of the old Will and Balmer candle factory. Now they're turning it into condo apartments. That smokestack is still there. They, they left it. The new developer is leaving that there, and they're going to preserve it. So George Balmer Sr., who taught our grandfather, he was the first, his first organ instructor, was born in Syracuse for a short period of time between 1878 and 1884, he came to St. Joseph's Church here in Utica. He was also the organist at Assumption Church from 1871 to 1930. Now, what I haven't figured out yet is how he was able to do some of those at the same time. So I'm pretty sure that he was, what he was doing was he, he was supervising the organ work with other students in Syracuse at Assumption while he was responsible for the school work he was doing over here. I also believe that he had other organists that he taught that could cover, on the weekends, could cover St. Joseph's so that he could do the masses back at Assumption. Um, that's more research, that's another project for another time. His father was Francis Balmer, who was also an organist at Assumption. His son was George Balmer Jr. He was also the organist at Assumption. After that was my grandfather, after my grandfather was our Uncle John. So if you look at the history of Assumption Church, from 1849 to 1954, there were five organists, three bombers and two fishers. So that's a, one of those interesting tidbits. John Fisher, you can actually see him here with our grandfather in a photo on the left. Uh, that was probably late 1940s, I believe, that was taken. And then you see him at the Oregon Council at Assumption, probably 1953. That was probably taken then. Okay, so now we're going to get back to the composing side. That's what you came here for, was the Sousa connection. So thank you for bearing with me as I gave you all this background to build this up, right? So what we have discovered is that his very first publication was the Electric Sparks Waltz in 1888. It was published by a company here in Utica, R.C. Burton. Now, R.C. Burton was not a music publisher. They were just a printer. But they did, as a side, they would publish local works. So they were his first publisher. About 10 years later, less than 10 years later, uh, George Fisher had developed a relationship with J. Fisher and Brother in New York City and published several works with them, including the Knights of Columbus March and Two-Step in 1897, Our Triumphant Flag, The Patriotic American, and you can see I've got the original sheet music here from that, and also the Knights of Com Columbus Hymnal, which is a small hymnal. I, have, I brought three of those with me today. I also brought a... Um, a piece uh, that was Homer Whitford's. So I have some of that, you can look at that. And then there's another book here that talks about uh, Professor Fisher's relationship with the Utica Symphony. Um, so these are the published works that actually made it out into the world at large. Other pieces that he published that we're aware of, Utica Boosters, Goldsmith Club March, National Medley Manila March, the Masonic Temple March, 
And another thing that he wrote was a full mass for the dedication and, dedication and consecration of the St. John's Church, including a separate piece for Vespers at that uh, service. Um, the electric sparks waltz, you see the newspaper clipping there, um, was noted that the piece begins with a graceful um, Polaka movement as an introduction, after which, and Polaka, I believe, means Polish, but they called it Polaka, um, after which the waltz properly comes tunefully and cleverly. Mr. Fisher is to be congratulated upon the first of his published compositions, and it is to be hoped that he will continue his efforts at that time. Now, this is 19 years of age, started studying the organ at 15, and now he's, he's got pieces being, um, being produced and published. And then just another short time after that, um, he's nationally and globally, I'll come back to that in a minute, globally known. So here's an image of this patriotic American piece. And then you see another one, that Our Triumphant Flag. This is the only sheet music that I have of his that, that I've been able to get my hands on. I have a lot of digitized images, meaning the originals or that somebody has them in the library. Um, on the left, the Booster's Marsh, handwritten score. Um, that actually came from my cousin, uh, Mary Bernand, and her family. So I was able to scan those. They actually had the original handwritten pieces of paper. And of course, the hymnal that we talked about that was, that was actually, the hymnal was actually re uh, printed several times, so it got a lot of use across the country at Knights of Columbus meetings. And the Knights of Columbus March itself um, was kind of interesting because um, it was obviously intended for that men's organization, the Knights of Columbus, but it got broader appeal. The fact that Sousa was willing to perform it when he was noted for only doing his own music, why? He wanted to sell these. And if you perform your own music, you promote it, you're more likely to get sales. Things haven't really changed that much. So the publishing rights uh, were important. And so the fact that he played this, I think, is, is noteworthy. Um, and that got a lot of attention here in, in central New York area, in Utica in particular. So the concert was April 1st, 1897, at the Utica Opera House, which is now a parking lot next to the Doubletree, right? That's where the Opera House was. It was the last concert of that tour. I say of the season, but they, their seasons were like four a year. So they were getting ready to head back to Weehawken, New Jersey, where they were going to be done, and, and April 1st was their last stop. They did the concert, got on the train, and they were gone. George Fisher was invited to sit in. He actually sat in with the band, played piano with the Sousa Band during the concert as they played his song, The Knights of Columbus March in Two-Step. The newspaper reviews were highly favorable. I found nothing that said that Fisher's march was acceptable. <laughs> they didn't use that, right? Um, the Sousa band utilized Fisher's handwritten band parts. Now, until this morning, I didn't realize, literally this morning, this, I finished these slides because I added some information. I didn't know what that really, how important that was. So April 1st, 1897, what, what was going on? December of 1896, Sousa had composed the Stars and Stripes Forever March but all he wrote it on was a piano score. Now, on May 14th, what day is today? May 14th, what a coincidence. On May 14th, 1897, which is six weeks after this concert in Utica, the very first performance by a band of Stars and Stripes Forever was in Philadelphia, 125 years ago today. I had no idea of that until this morning, because I was always taught that he wrote that march in 1896, and he published the first piano part in December. It was like a Christmas present. People bought those sheet musics for Christmas presents. As it turned out, he wrote the piano part, but hadn't done the band score. So when he was informed, Sousa, when Sousa was informed that he was gonna have an opportunity to play that at that concert in Philadelphia, he said, I better get to work. So he was on this tour, writing out the band parts from using the music score. It turns out that's exactly how Professor Fisher wrote Knights of Columbus. He wrote the piano part, and I have copies of the, of the piano part that are, that are available uh, published. He wrote that, and, and it was published in early in 1897, and when he found out the Sousa band was gonna actually play his piece, Sousa said, that's fine, as long as you've got parts for us. So at the same time that John Philip Sousa was eagerly awaiting his premiere of Stars and Stripes Forever, 
George Fisher was doing the same thing, scrambling to get those band parts written out. Why does that matter? Because that answers a question, which I'll come back to in a minute, a very important question about the, the actual copies of music that we have. The original parts of those music that my grandfather wrote are in the Sousa Library at the University of Champaign-Urbana in Illinois. Those are the original handwritten parts for all of the band parts. Last year in 2021, I convinced Barnhouse Music Publishing Company, who still had printing rights, but understand the copyrights and my grandfather's stuff have long, have, have long sunset. So they agreed to reprint those and that allowed us to have the concert you know, a few weeks ago. Um, and again, thanks to uh, going on Facebook this morning, someone who saw my post about this event and about the concert is involved with the historical work that's being done on behalf of the US military band. And she sent me the actual contract between the Sousa band and the Utica Opera House. So until I got up this morning, I didn't know that existed. So April 1st, 1897, Utica, New York, Knights of Columbus Banch, uh, Knights of Columbus March is performed by Sousa's band. The Rome band preceded it that Rome concert a couple of days. Four months later, this piece was produced and performed in Adelaide, Australia. It made its way around the globe and was performed there, which I thought was amazing. Here is a copy from courtesy of the Sousa Library in University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Thank you very much for keeping that if you're watching. And this is the D-flat piccolo part, which ironically is the wrong key for most piccolo players today. And I found that out when I asked a band in Illinois, the Naperville Community Band, to do a rehearsal run of this, just a sight read for me. And I convinced the band leader, I don't know why he did, he took pity on me about eight years ago, and he did that. And the piccolo played two bars and then put her piccolo down because it wasn't, she clearly figured out it was in the wrong key and she wasn't ready to start transposing this piece, sight reading it. So when Barnhouse reproduced it last year, they did it in the correct key, they transposed it properly. So you can see there the stamp property of John Philip Sousa and my grandfather's signature on the top right, in the D-flat, incorrect key, piccolo part. So we are now going to segue into what happened after that. I play golf. I was sitting at the bar with a friend of mine. Didn't no idea what he does for a living. I asked him. He said, oh, I'm a band director. So my friend who I play golf with is a band director at East Syracuse Manoa High School. Um, his name is Chuck Penfield. And we were talking about music. I said, you know, our family has a whole music barrack, and you probably don't know this, Chuck, because we don't talk about this kind of stuff. We only talk about how bad we played today. So we, um, we got into that, and I mentioned about that I had recently discovered through my genealogy work that my grandfather was actually a published composer. I had no idea growing up. My father said he was an organist. So we found this out, and we started talking, and he said, you know, I play in Central Winds band, and we're really good. Maybe we could play it. So I'm like, sounds good to me. I just got to find the music. He said, can you get the music? I said, well, I have it in handwritten parts. And he said, well, we probably can't read that. And uh, let me wait to work on it. I since have found several different versions of the band parts, some of which were written on small format that you would put on a, on a music holder on your instrument while you're marching down the street, which most concert musicians don't want to read that while they're sitting in a, in a concert hall. So Barnhouse, as I said, was eager to help us and they, they published it. Um, and they didn't make any money on it because I, I think it cost me $80 to get it. They must, they must have hours and hours and hours of computing work in there to, uh, to arrange all that. So thank you, Barnhouse, uh, for that. Hopefully other bands will now pick it up and use it now that it's available again. So what we're gonna do now, I hope, is I'm going to um, introduce this concert. So this was April 24th. So we're still celebrating this 125th uh, anniversary of this. So I'm about to try to hit this to play and hopefully it will work. Um, this was held at Oneida High School by the Central Winds Band. And what you're gonna hear is a little bit of an introduction from Andy Perry, who's a conductor and uh, really uh, music director for this ensemble. And, and then I will give a few remarks and then you'll hear the piece. And then after the piece, there'll be some follow-up remarks from James Tapia. Uh, which I am including here because I appreciate the support that they gave to this project. So let's see if this works. Um, it's really quite a, a 
different piece for us. So the last uh, couple of years, about a year ago, uh, one of our members in the field, Chuck Pinfield, said his friend of his, his grandfather had written a piece for the Sousa Band. And I'm like, okay. Um, and it has never been recorded. So this piece written by George Fisher, uh, played by the Sousa Band in 1897. And we thought it would be really a nice treat to be able to bring up his grandson, Mike Fisher, on stage to conduct and to tell you a little bit about this story of the piece. So please come up, Mike. which was about a year after Sousa recorded, I'm sorry, record, after he composed Stars and Stripes Forever, which is probably the, the, the most famous march on the entire planet, right, of all time. <laughs> about a year after that, my grandfather, George Fisher, we have, uh, my brother is here, also George Fisher. In Utica, New York, he was, at the time, he was the music director at St. John, historic St. John's Church. His history in the West End of Utica predates that from the age of 10, he studied piano, and then boys, he was part of the St. Joseph's, which was a family parish in the West End of Utica. Since, since he really was in elementary school, he was part of the boys choir. And then through several parishes in the Mohawk Valley, ended up at St. John's for over 40 <coughs> years before he retired to take the same position for about 15 years at the Assumption Church in Syracuse. He composed a number of other other marches that were that were performed all over the world. This specific piece was was performed by the John Philip Sousa Band in 1897. Four months later, we found it was performed in Queensland, Australia. So it literally went around the globe. So, without further ado, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed this fun. Thank you. 
Thank you again for being here. My name is James Tapia. I'm one of the conductors of this fabulous ensemble, and Mike, you did a beautiful job, and it's wonderful to have the experience in the history of music making for Central New York and, and your family and our family together here. You did a beautiful job, and uh, we really appreciate you being here and being a part of this experience. So that was fun. I can't tell you how much fun I had doing that. And they are a fabulous band. So a quick side story on this, and we do have a music director here from Sherburn Irville uh, in the audience. We were talking a little bit before we started, but when I was doing this, I thought I was conducting a band of music teachers who were really good musicians. So I prepared mentally for that, and I thought, all right, th these guys are good. I'm going to have to get my game up. I haven't conducted an ensemble like this in at least 20 years. So I better get my A game. What I just realized a couple of days ago, I was not conducting a group of musicians, instrumentalists. I was conducting a group of conductors. <laughs> and if I had known that then, I probably would have uh, hidden in the closet in the back of the stage there. But uh, it would have taken me... It would have taken me a little more effort to get ready and psyched for this. But again, the Central Winds Ensemble is a fantastic band. You, if you have an opportunity to hear them play, I highly recommend it. So now I got to go to the next slide, which is last before we close. And just to open up the discussion for questions and comments, now you're going to monitor the Zoom uh, participants. So we'll start with what's in here. So if anybody has any comments, uh, if you saw something here that hits home for your family experience or anything that you want to share or any questions about what I've been working on here? I, I did it. Was that the first time that was played? Since when, do you know? So, yeah, so Patrick's asking if this is the first time it was played since when. So as I mentioned earlier, I did get a recording of a rehearsal sight read by the Naperville Community Band, for which I'm very grateful because it gave me a chance to hear the piece uh, for the first time other than visualizing it or using the piano part. And um, to my knowledge, that was the first time in 90 years or so. I found some performances at high school graduation here or something there um, in, in the 1930s, I think was, was the latest one I found. So 80 to 90 years. Um, is the, again, it may have been performed since then. I am proud to tell you, though, that it's never been recorded until this project. So I have two recordings of it now. Actually, I actually have three because I did a rehearsal from Central Wind. So... Um, but this one, obviously, is fantastic. The group is great, and the fact that they were um, willing to help me with this project, I mean, this would have been a fun presentation if you care about music and Utica and some of the stuff we talked about, but having the ability to actually hear the piece performed by a, a fantastically capable band, I think, is, uh, is amazing. So, um, other questions, comments? Yes? Um, the um, company in New York that published um, some of the music, was it just a coincidence? Yes, it was. That is a really good question. So the question was, is it a coincidence that George Fisher's music was published by Joseph Fisher and Brother out of um, New York City? They were actually from Ohio, and then they moved to New York City and back. Don't you know, I spent a lot of time trying to track down a connection to that part of the Fisher family in my genealogy work. The answer is I couldn't do it yet. I'm not saying they're not. As far as I know, however, there was no connection here in the United States between the two families. There were a lot of Fishers. A lot of fishers with a C in there changed it to, and dropped it. We have a whole, what I call the Denver relatives, a whole group of our family that left Utica and settled in Denver. Phenomenal stories out there of what they accomplished. And they actually dropped the H. And I think the reason they dropped it was it was dropped here by a census worker and by other, if you go to the Utica directories, there was no C in it. So um, I hope one day to discover that we're related to Joseph Fisher and Carl Fisher, which is one of their family members who was a very, very uh, widely known um, composer as well. So, thank you for that question. Anything else? Your, your niece in the chat said this is a great presentation from Joyce. Oh, Joyce, thank you. Thank you, Joyce. It's always nice when you get the um, feedback online. Anything else? So, how long have you been working on this whole research project? I mean, the layers of onion skin that are coming are apparent. You could write a book out of this, but how long have you been working on it? Well, I have to tell you, it would be eight books because there's eight rabbit holes. I mean, it goes on and on and on. In fact, I actually thought about writing a book. The title of the book would have been The Professor and Mary Grace, 
that was that was the title, but there was so much more to tell that I, I just don't know where to go with that. But I've been working on this part of it for about 10 years. And again, I have to thank Tom Trenisky from Fulton History because through the, my genealogy work, I discovered that my father withheld information um, that I would like to know. So if you've ever been asked this question, if you could go back and talk to one person from history, who would you like to talk to? And some people will say, well, I'd like to talk to Caesar. I'd like to talk to Jesus. I'd like to talk to whoever. Um, Abraham Lincoln. I'd like to talk to my father and say, why the heck didn't you tell me this stuff? So it would probably be a one-sided conversation. On the other hand, I'd like to talk to Elizabeth because Elizabeth knew at her age, our great aunt, we called her auntie, that was our family nickname for her, but she was Lizzie when she was a little girl. She knew our great-great-grandmother, who was Veronica Ginster Fisher, who came over in 1842 from, the, um, from Western Germany in the area that's called the Rhineland Palatinate, I believe or in German, it's rheinland Pfalz. That's in a town called Schuld is where they came from. Uh, we have a lot of other history about that. But it's been about 10 years, Patrick, that I, that I figured that part of it out. Yes, yeah, so we have a question in the back. Yes, sir. Uh, what, what, why do you think your father didn't tell you more? Number one, number two, Mary Grace, is it? Mary, Mary her, Grace, is her, her name was Mary Grace Shaughnessy, yes. Yeah. Was she musical? Yes, she was a singer in, in so my grandfather was a choir director, and he's got a soprano in the choir. Next thing you know, they're getting married. So I thought, hmm. yeah, so he, uh, you know, why not? So a German family, strong, clearly German family. This was the first, I correct myself, this was the second incident where I found one of our German family members married a, an Irish woman. The first one was Michael Fisher, which isn't me. My wife happens to be Irish as well, ironically. But there was a Michael Fisher who, who was a builder here. He, be, he started as a carpenter, and then after um, the Civil War era, he, he be, actually became a builder. His father-in-law was a guy by the name of Richard, so we believe was Irish, based on the change in the name and how that all happened. And so he married an Irish woman that as he was working for, essentially, his father-in-law. Um, so opportunity knocks, I guess, right? Great question. Thank you. And question one, why, why do you think your father... Right. Yeah, so the other question was, why, why do we think that our father didn't share this information with us? But that's a really good question. That, that kind of haunts me. The question is, did I not ask? Because I was a brat. So I'll ask my sister, because you're older than me. You're, you should know. Why didn't he tell us this stuff? I don't know. I mean, I remember him saying he was an organist at the, the Assumption, and that was it. He talked more about his mother. Right, so this is a good point. So what Midge is sharing with us is that he talked more about his mother. Now, remember that she died in 1940, so my dad was born in 14, so 26. I'm sure that her death affected him. Um, also, by the time my father was born in 1914, a lot of what happened in Professor Fisher's career as a composer was, was behind him. Because after that, the only thing that he really composed were, were things for specific purposes here in Utica. So I also would know that my father was the youngest of nine children, born in 1914, to his father who was, and mother who, who were older. So there were some generational gaps in there. Um, so I, I think that may have been part of it as well. And as, as I said earlier, we just didn't talk about the family a lot. We didn't, there's a lot of that information that just didn't come up. I think every family finds that. Mm -hmm. they, they just didn't talk about the past. Or Right. They did. Mm. Well, it's today and tomorrow. And so the comment from the audience is that, um, for you watching on Zoom, is that we, we just, we didn't talk enough about these kinds of things in the family. We just got on with our daily routines. And, and I think there's some, there is some truth to that. There's no question. Uh, uh, on that note, my father fought in World War II. He went to France right after D-Day. He wasn't there for D-Day, but he was there shortly after. I actually have maps in my possession that he carried on the fields after that. Their responsibility was cleaning up, right? And it was not pretty. And the map that I have has blood on it, right? So uh, as far as I know, he was never injured in, in the battle. So somehow somebody's blood got on his map that he carried. I bought him for a present, the movie, Saving Private Ryan. And I got him to watch the first 10 minutes of it. And then we had to break for dinner. And he ref didn't refuse. He declined to ever finish watching. And well, we'll do it another time. I really think that he didn't, there were some things in his past he didn't want to, want to visit. And I think that's, that's typical for a lot of people who've gone through war, war experiences. 
That has nothing to do with Professor Fisher, however, so dad, you're not getting off the hook on that one. So <laughs> if you're watching, nice try. Anything else? All right, before I step down, I want to thank Patrick Reynolds. We've been working on this for a while. COVID interrupted us. This was supposed to be last fall. Thank you. And that is a good thing because we've learned so much more in the last six months and the concert happened. So thanks again for everybody who's here, all of you watching by Zoom or on YouTube. And thank you. Just to mention for the people on Zoom and you in the audience, this has been recorded. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. And please like and share with your friends. And even though you didn't write a book, the story is preserved in some way. So this is excellent. Thank you very much. I'll get there. Thank you, Patrick.